right, well, good morning, Holy Cross. Good to see everybody this morning. I can tell we're chatty here for the summertime, so uh, good, uh, good to see everyone. Uh, I am back uh, here in town uh, after with our other adult leaders taking 10 of our students to the National Youth Gathering that was in Houston this year. It was a great trip. Uh, thank you all so much for all of your support, all of your prayers, uh, and everything. The kids did a great job uh, and uh, were able to learn a lot uh, with a lot of speakers and, and a lot of things and learning that God, uh, it, through Jesus, is in all things and, uh, and, and gives us that word. Uh, so, uh, next Sunday, a week from today, during the Bible class hour, Sunday school hour, we will be in the sanctuary here, and uh, we, have, we will have a slideshow for you uh, so that the kids can share their stories and, and um, uh, say good things about me and, uh, and all the rest of it. But please, uh, if you don't normally come early for Bible class, please do next week because uh, the kids would really love to uh, share with you everything that they saw and did uh, and, and all the rest of it. It's going to be a neat uh, week. And... Uh, they will tell you everything uh, about what happened for them and, and with them uh, in the past week as we were in Houston for that. So uh, please avail yourself of that. Another reminder for this week, uh, Pastor Tom's class does not meet this Wednesday, but they will meet next Wednesday, and that will wrap up uh, for the summer. Then uh, we'll take a few weeks off uh, after that. So uh, that's the schedule, not this week, but next week uh, is when they will meet. And I think that is all I have for you uh, by way of announcements. So uh, with that, we have come here for worship this morning. Let's go ahead and stand and greet one another, and then we'll sing.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. Let us confess our sins unto the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord who has begun a good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, grant us the spirit to hear your word and know the one thing needful, that by your word and spirit we may live according to your good will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And please be seated for the reading of Scripture. The Old, Test the Old Testament reading is from Genesis 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, <clears throat> three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seas of fine flour knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and young, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Colossians chapter 1. You who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the, go of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ, for this I toil, 
struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This is the word of the Lord. And please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. I would invite the children forward for the kids' message. Why don't you guys come down and join me? Come on down. All right. Look at y'all. You got your crowns. I dig it. Very cool. I'll sit here so you guys can see me. Everybody doing good? You have a good week? Well, it's a good thing because Sunday is the first day of the week. So even if you didn't have a good week before, you can have a good week now going forward. That's something for all of us to remember. So I want to share with you the story that I just read for everybody here in church. Okay, that's a better place. And uh, it's a story. Jesus goes to see his friends, and there's, um, it's like a family. Like you have your brothers and sisters. Well, these were two sisters and one brother, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And what we see is that they're there, and Mary is sitting there listening to Jesus because Jesus is talking to them, and he's teaching them, and he's telling them stuff. And then Martha is doing a bunch of other stuff, like she's making sure that they have food, and she's making sure that they have something to drink, and she's running around all over the place, uh, and uh, she complains to Jesus, and she says, Jesus, you're here, and we want to help you and do a lot of stuff for you, but Mary is just sitting there listening to you instead of helping me run around and do all of this stuff. And what Jesus says to them is that, listen, what Mary is doing by listening to me, that is actually the most important thing. And it's a good thing for us to keep in mind. And that is, the most important thing is always for us to listen to Jesus. Yeah, you heard that when I was reading that for the adults, yeah. And so, you already knew that? Yeah, it's a good thing to know. And it's a good thing for us to be reminded of. Hi. Uh, And so what we always want to do, and other things are important for sure, but the most important thing is for us to listen to Jesus. The most important thing is for us to listen to Jesus. So that means that we're reading our Bibles. That means that when we have devotions with our family, that we're paying attention when our mom and dad are doing devotions with us. That means that when we go to Sunday school, we're listening to our Sunday school teachers. The most important thing for all of us, and there's lots of important things, but the most important thing is that we listen to Jesus. Do you think you can listen to Jesus? I think you can. I think you can, and I think you will. So, good. Let's pray. My friends, okay? Dear Jesus, help us to listen to you. Help us to listen to our parents and our pastor and our teachers. We love you, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. All right, you guys can go back by your families and we will sing. Y'all can sing loud too, okay? Could destroy, be there. 
I thought there was one more verse, but here we are. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, we have come from the National Youth Gathering uh, to be with you here this morning. We actually studied the book of Colossians at the gathering, and so uh, I will be preaching uh, from some of that uh, this week, possibly next week as well, and just sharing uh, some of that good information and teaching that we were able to uh, have uh, from the youth gathering. I also, uh, I meant to say this during the welcome, uh, but uh, I bring you uh, greetings from Dr. Jerry Kieschnick, who I was able, able to see at the gathering, and he told me to tell everybody hey, so or hi. He said hi, I say hey. Uh, so uh, he uh, was definitely thinking about y'all when he saw me, and so I uh, wanted to extend that greeting to you as well. As we study here in Colossians, we're talking about this church, this new church that's in Colossa. Uh, they heard Paul in Ephesus, some of the people there, and uh, they repeated it, and they were baptized, and uh, now they have a lot of questions. They loved Jesus, and so they said, okay, it's time for us to plant a church. And so we've got this church in Colossa, and they're doing the best they can, but they are admittedly, self-admittedly, in over their head, and they have a lot of questions, and they need some clarification on some issues, Uh, and they don't have some of the things that we would have today. There's no church planting network for them to go to and ask questions of. There's no celebrity pastors on Twitter that they can check in with. Uh, They they are kind of there by themselves, and so they want to pose these questions to Paul, and he comes back with some uh, loving answers for this church in Colossa. And what Paul stresses to them is this. It, the, the problems and the issues that you have, those are not the main thing. The main thing is Jesus. You guys need to be square on Jesus, on who he is, on what he does, uh, because what's happening is in this church, people are picking and choosing different aspects of Jesus and, and, and other things. So they've got some pagan practices over here, and they've got some Jewish practices over here, and they've got some Gnosticism that they're dealing with here, and they're just kind of doing this picking and choosing thing. And Paul says, no, the thing is, the thing is Jesus. You guys need to be square away on Jesus. And so this sermon will be about Jesus as all sermons should be. Right? Yeah. And so that's what we're going to see. Because there's so much confusion out there and there's so many different things moving in any different directions. And no, we are going to talk about Jesus. And so let's look at it here in Colossians. uh, And I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to look mostly at the verses right before the ones that that I read, uh, that were read by David a moment ago. So uh, let's look at Colossians chapter 1, and I will pick it up with verse 15. Here's what it says. He is, Jesus is, the image of the invisible God. Here's what we're saying. If you want to know who God is, is. If you want to know what he's like, if you want to know what his tone is, if you want to know how he behaves, if you want to know how he feels, if you want to know how he responds, then you need to study, look at, and watch Jesus. That's how you're going to find out about God. Jesus is the image, the picture, the embodiment, the incarnation, the visible manifestation of the invisible God, you need to look at Jesus. And so if you come and say, I want to understand God, listen, if you want to understand God, you look to understand Jesus. That's how it works. It's kind of like Uncle Cy on Duck Dynasty. Because one of the things that Uncle Cy says, and he has this kind of verbal tick if you've ever watched the show, which... I assume that you have because you're a Christian. And um, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. But he's got this verbal tick where he always says, hey, right? 
Uncle Si, hey, hey, hey. Uh, and one of the things when asked about it that he says is, look, hey can mean yes, hey can mean no, hey can mean I don't know. The thing about it is you got to understand me to understand hey. Now think about that for a minute. If you want to understand thing, the things of God, if you want to understand the things that God says, you understand Jesus, and then you can understand what God says. It's kind of another way of saying that. So if I want to know about God's strength and God's power and, and all of this, I'm going to look to passages like this that talk about the strength and power that Jesus has, that Jesus indeed has power over death and the grave. And then I can understand those things about the Lord. If you want to understand God, if you want to understand this world, then you got to understand Jesus. And there is no understanding of the God of the Bible outside of Jesus Christ. That's the truth. It makes sense, doesn't it? It's really great. It's good news. So if you want to know about the na nature and the character of God, you watch Jesus and then you learn everything that you need to know. What are some things that we learn about God through Jesus? And there's a ton of them. I'll give you three this morning. The first thing we understand about God through Jesus is that God is merciful. God is not only merciful with individuals, God is merciful with whole cities. So we have this scene, and I'll give you an example. We have this scene in Luke chapter 13 where Jesus, out of love, cries over the city of Jerusalem. And we hear it in his voice, in the way he talks about it. Jerusalem, how I long to, re to reconcile myself to you. Merciful. And he says, but, but you, got, you, you kill. You kill the prophets that I send to you. You stone the messengers that I direct in your direction, that I send to you. And he weeps over the city. And it's not a controlled rage or something like that. No, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem because they scoff and they refuse to be reconciled to him. And so he cries for them. This is a far cry from the impression that some people have about God. That he's just up there holding lightning bolts ready to rain them down on you when he's mad at you. That, that's not the God of the Bible. That's not God as we see him through Jesus. No, he weeps over an entire city. A city that refuses to obey him. So God is merciful, yes, to this whole city. How about this? God is also merciful to individuals. How about the New Testament story of Zacchaeus? Now straight up, at the beginning of the story, Zacchaeus, huge jerk. He's raising taxes for Rome. He is killing and oppressing hundreds of thousands of his own people and ripping them off <clears throat> and so Jesus is coming by and Zacchaeus wants to see him he's heard a lot about Jesus so what does he do he climbs upon the sycamore tree so we can see Jesus and Jesus looks at him and Jesus says Zacchaeus come down from there and come here because I am going to your house today really all of this evil that Zacchaeus has done, every effort that he has made to separate himself from God's people and to separate himself from the Lord. But no, Jesus invites himself over for dinner and they talk at this dinner, they talk about the things of God and they talk about reconciliation. And Zacchaeus repents and gives back beyond what he took from the people. All because Jesus showed mercy to him. 
He's merciful. And when Zacchaeus does this, Jesus says, surely salvation has come to this house because of your repentance, Zacchaeus. Blatant guilt on the part of Zacchaeus. Jesus responds with mercy. Jesus is merciful. Here's one of the other things we know about Jesus from the Bible. We know that Jesus is compassionate, and so we know that the Lord is compassionate. Now, we had the story today about Mary and Martha, and they uh, have this interaction where Martha's doing all the work, and Mary's just listening to Jesus, and, you know, Jesus said, Martha, Martha, Martha. We all like that one, don't we? Well, there's an episode later in their life that's a little more difficult that's harder for us to joke around about, isn't it? In John 11, Mary and Martha send word to Jesus that Lazarus is ill and is close to death. And Jesus tells his disciples, uh, look, this is not the kind of illness that leads to death. This is the kind of illness that is given for the glory of God. Now, that's a interesting and complex idea for us to consider and for us to think about. So he spends two more days of teaching before he heads out to go see Lazarus, as he's been told from Mary and Martha that he is on his deathbed. And he arrives, and Martha says to Jesus, where have you been? Lazarus is dead. He's been in the tomb for a long time and everybody there is sobbing and weeping over the loss of this brother, of this probably young man. And so to Mary, Jesus says, you, you know what, take me, take me to the tomb. And so she does. Why does Jesus go to the tomb. He goes there to raise Lazarus from the dead. He's already said this, that he's going to do it. And so he gets there and people are weeping and people are wailing and uh, they don't know what to do. And what does Jesus do when he sees all of this? Jesus wept. He cried. He had compassion upon these people when he saw their grief. He's hurt and he feels heavy and he begins to weep. Jesus has compassion on those who are experiencing loss. Now the story goes well, doesn't it? Because Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. After the Bible tells us one of my favorite things in parts in the Bible. It tells us that Lazarus in your King James, he stinketh. Yeah, because he was dead. But then he's alive again because of Jesus. Because Jesus had compassion on his dear friends. One other thing we know about Jesus. We know he's all powerful. How about this? In Luke chapter 8, when Jesus calms the storm, Right? The disciples are there. They are on the boat, on the Sea of Galilee. I've been on the Sea of Galilee. They're terrified. They go downstairs. And Jesus is asleep in the midst of all of this. And so then Jesus goes up top. He rebukes the storm, and the storm stops. And what's the reaction from the disciples? Who is this guy, even the wind and the waves obey him. He has power over the wind and the waves. How about in Luke 17? Jesus is met by these 10 lepers and they talk for a while and they leave and Jesus heals all 10 of them using his power so they are no longer ill anymore and only one of them comes back to thank him. Nine of them are ungrateful, one of them is grateful and comes back to Jesus and says, thank you that you have healed me. 
with your power. It's really interesting, you know, when, uh, if you ever had a conversation with an atheist, someone who says they don't believe in God at all, uh, when you dig down, when they say that, if you ask them more questions, it becomes very clear there's kind of two tenets to atheism, and that is that there is no God, and I hate him. You ever notice that? It's a real thing. People don't get worked up about stuff that, don't, that doesn't exist, do they? No, see, they, they betray their own belief with their attitude. Nobody ever is like, unicorns, I just can't stand them. Nobody has that reaction because we know that they're not real. Sorry, kids. If anything goes well and we did it, that's on us. If something goes bad, then it's somebody else's fault, right? That's usually how we operate, right? How dare God do this? No, see, in this case, Jesus flexes, Jesus shows his power, Jesus heals all 10 lepers. Whether they believe it or not, he healed them. One was grateful, nine were ungrateful. <clears throat> How about the man in Mark 5 who is filled with demons? And scripture tells us that he constantly wept, constantly cut himself, that he could not be bound. Anytime they try to chain him up, he breaks the chains. And so Jesus comes and the man runs up to him and he falls on the ground and the demons speak through him. And ask, Jesus, have you come to destroy us? You know, Hollywood gives us this picture of good and evil, of this dualism. There's yin and there's yang and these two competing um, attitudes, these two competing things. Uh, listen, when you read the Bible, here's what you see. It ain't a fair fight, bro. Jesus is ultimately the one with the power. And these demons tremble before him. There will come a time when there will be two armies that meet at Megiddo at the place of conflict in the Old Testament. And these two armies will come to bear and Jesus will come to make war and there will be a sword coming out of his mouth and fire out of his eyes and that war has already been won by Jesus. That's the truth. That's how much power he has. And all of the enemies of God will be consumed before him. And Jesus, so Jesus encounters this, encounters rather, this demon-filled man and says, tell me your name. And the demons speak and the demons say, our name is Legion, for we are many. Very creepy. Not, let's fight, but they say, don't destroy us, because they know who really has the power. And so what happens is the demons are cast into these pigs, right? These unclean animals and the, the pigs run off the cliff into the water. We don't, we don't really show that illustration on the flannel graph with the, with the kids, you know? But the pigs run, the demons run, they destroy themselves. They seem to be, the demons do, seem to be the only ones who understand that Jesus is here and Jesus has that power so we said, Jesus has mercy, he has compassion, he has power. We could go on and on. We see all of these things in him. And it says here in Colossians 15, uh, chapter 1, verse 15, he is the firstborn of all creation. That he is not created. And we get this mention of this status of, as the firstborn 130 times. Uh, it's mentioned how important the firstborn is that they're the one they're, they're the one who carries the line forward. God refers to Israel as my beloved firstborn son. What does it mean that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation? It means that he is the one who has authority. 
Verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Here's what it's saying. Creation itself, that is not all there is. And this is kind of a little swipe at Caesar. It says, no, all of creation actually serves something higher. Creation doesn't just serve Caesar. It serves something higher. And that God created all things and that they are good. As it's referenced in Genesis 1 and 2. And so we can see the beauty and the reality of Jesus everywhere, in everything. And as the kids learned in Houston this week, we can see Jesus in all things. And it talks about here that he is, he holds all things together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be Preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. In all of this very specific language about Jesus, it's to clear up some of the syncretism that I mentioned at the beginning that the, has, has made its way into the Colossian church. Now, if these, things about, if these things are true about Jesus, that he is merciful, that he is compassionate, that he is powerful, and many other things that we could say about him, if those things are true, then number one, the commands of God in the Bible should be celebrated. Like David celebrates them in the Psalms. And we hear the story of David that he just sometimes he just lays awake at night and he uh, considers and contemplates and celebrates the, the law of the Lord. He loves it so much that he can't even sleep. That's how much we should love the law of the Lord. That's how it works. See, that the Lord is not trying to rob you of your joy. Instead, he's leading you into something greater. He's leading you into further blessing than what you just see on the surface. The second thing, if this is true, we should be more serious about our spiritual lives than most of us are. Right? We should be celebrating and enjoying holiness, we should be all the more pressing into him. He should govern our whole life, everything about it. That we don't have these different boxes and different compartments in our lives where, uh, well, this part of my life, the Lord's not really involved in. I'm, I'm giving him everything I have over here, but this thing, no, this thing is not for him. No, 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 he, he is involved in all things. We learn as well, it's kind of our last point here. He is the ultimate goal. It's not about what I get out of him. It's not about what I do for him. And understand this too, God loves you. Not some future version of you. Not some idyllic, you know, piece of yourself that you see down the road and say, well, when I finally get over the hump, when I finally get to this place, then I'll have my act together enough for the Lord to love me. No, the Lord loves you right now. And I want you to know that. And I want you to hear that. He loves you, not some future version of you. Does he still have a lot of work to do on you? Yes. Does he love you right now? Yes. 
How much? He loved you enough to send his son to die on the cross for you. And he's done all the work and he's shown all the mercy and all the compassion and all of the power and he's never more great, he never more, more greatly expresses and demonstrates those things than he does when he's on the cross, when he dies in your place for your sins. Jesus loves you. Know it. Proclaim it. Celebrate it. In Jesus' good name. Amen. We'll now worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Uh, We'd invite you to fill out those communication cards as well so we know who all is here. And uh, we will worship the Lord uh, at this time with those things. the
Okay, I'm on now. Thank you. Uh, and we'll continue with the creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, your power holds all things together in heaven and on earth. Give wisdom to those who lead our nation and guidance to those who make, administer, and judge our laws so that life be protected and justice administered. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your word speaks hope and life. Open our ears to hear your voice and our hearts to believe in Jesus Christ and follow him as Savior and Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your mercy extends to all our needs and your grace gives healing according to your will. Hear us on behalf of your children, Lord. We pray for the family of Bruce Baxter, who died this morning. We pray as well, Lord, for the family and friends of uh, Jim Lee, uh, Jefferson County deputy uh, who was killed. We pray, Lord, for David and for Bella, for O.W., for Rick, for Rosemarie, for Alma, for Nancy Hoffman, our organist, for Paula and Sandra, for Lewis, for Sharon's mother, Audrey, and those, Lord, who we name in our hearts. And, Lord, all others who stand in need, grant to them grace sufficient for all their needs and sustain them in the hour of their trial. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you have granted us a place at the table of your son. Help us to receive his body and blood with repentance and faith and to keep in holy lives the precious gift we will receive upon our lips. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear us as we pray, Lord, the prayer that you have given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. Lord Jesus Christ, the night on which he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. I defy thee, death I now decry thee, fear I bid thee cease, world thou shalt not harm me, nor thy breaths alarm me, while I sing of peace, God's great power. Yeah. 
stand? Please stand for prayer. O oh God, by the patient suffering of your only begotten Son, you have beaten down the pride of the old enemy. Now help us, we humbly pray, rightly, to treasure in our hearts all that our Lord has of his goodness, born for our sake, that following his blessed example, we may bear with all patience all that is adverse to us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.